Well, he's an artist. You know, uh, it's a true artist. His earlier years, he was painting, and he was doing prints, and he was doing watercolors, and he was doing oils, and then he was doing wood carvings. The content of his work being so uh, grounded in nature make him a Northwest artist. You know, when they built a floating bridge, there are several proposals. One was to cut a big ditch here, and if they did that, they'll go right through my property. About that time, I, I thought about this sculpture, and I made the sculpture, and then I called it Evil Eye on I-90. One thing that amazes me about my father is he didn't build his first fountain until he was 50 years old. You know, and this is the major part of his career that he's known for. Maybe that was some of his most creative years, the last 30 years, from 50 to 85. I think my mother has always been supportive and to a certain extent has encouraged and maybe even so far as pushed my father to, to, to excel and do greater and greater things. All the kids learned dad's love of the art, the joy. Art was just the, the natural thing at, at the Sudakala house. And so somehow all the kids ended up involved in the arts. Marcus is uh, the conductor and music teacher of Garfield High School, and he's really done a fantastic job in building up that orchestra. Deems is, is a jazz musician, and he has been continuously since he was in high school. And he has three uh, CDs or, or records. Actually, it's quite interesting because, you know, it was always, uh, are you George Sudakawa's son? And then it was always Deems' brother. <laughs> I uh, started in my father's studio as an apprentice. And the more I did it, the more I found I enjoyed it. And it was never pushed on me, you know, or it was never said that, oh, you must be your father's, you know, son that, that takes on this tradition of, of, of sculpting. Isn't that before the Seattle Art Museum? Yes, yes. I have been working as a freelance writer and editor and also a curator, and I think that all of us were imbued with the value of art. There are seven grandchildren in the family. The fact that we have a very warm nuclear and extended family now may have something to do with the fact that they both grew up in a disjointed family, so to speak. My mother left California when she was one and left her mother and came back and lived with relatives in Japan until she was 13. My father, uh, his own mother died and his stepmother became his mother for many years and that family moved from Seattle to Japan and he lived there from the age of 7 to 17. I lived with my grandmother on my mother's side, who comes from an old warrior or samurai family. So this suit of armor that you see in the hallway was in the family for 400 years. And on uh, special occasions, such as uh, Boys Festival, I was allowed to wear that and go out and play war games with my neighborhood kids. My grandmother used to take me to the performance of the no drama, kabuki, uh, flower arrangement, tea ceremony, all these things. Every week, once a week, we used to be taken. And uh, we didn't like it very much, you know. We just revolted, but still, she was very, very strict about it. 
My grandfather comes from uh, a farming area in the mountains. Uh, his family owned, as far as you can see, But as a young man, he uh, traveled to Kyoto, the old capital city of Japan, to uh, study Zen, Buddhism, painting and sculpture. He wanted to become a, a cultured gentleman. In the meantime, his mountains, his forests and rice fields, one by one, were disappearing, going away, because he had to have all this money to support culture. And he used to invite me to come to his house and uh, stay with him. And every day, he would show me uh, all these uh, uh, fine things. I was not doing very well in high school in Japan, and uh, I was a disgrace to the family. And so uh, one day I told my father that I want to become an artist, and this really uh, was a great shock to him because he expected me to become a businessman. He was an exporter, importer. So the time finally came when my father, uh, he actually disinherited me. He said, we don't want you here anymore. You'll go back to America. He never saw his father again, never communicated with him or corresponded with him um, until he became a professor at the university and his father accepted him back into the family. So he actually grew up with cousins and uncles here in Seattle. My art teacher at Broadway High School, Miss Jones, she was a marvelous person person and a very uh, enterprising uh, art teacher and encouraged us to do woodblock prints like these. Every year I go to Alaska uh, to work in Salmon Cannery and uh, the base pay was $50 a month. Well, Miss Jones told me that I must attend the university art school and pursue uh, this uh, art study. And she really convinced me. These are some of the items I did as a freshman in the art school. This is kind of a beginning of my attempt at modern art. Right after Pearl Harbor, I got a letter from uh, President Roosevelt to report to the Army. <laughs> and so I was inducted in the U.S. Army. And uh, they uh, made me an instructor of Japanese language. I uh, made many, uh, several trips back uh, to the West Coast to visit my relatives in uh, relocation camps. And uh, while I was visiting, uh, my sister, I met uh, Hayame. Since there was not much of a way of uh, entertainment, so uh, every weekend we had a uh, variety show. And what I learned the daytime, at the weekend, I performed on the stage. So that kept, uh, kept me busy. <laughs> get married right away. I wanted to wait till the war was over. So she came to Seattle in 1947. We got married. Aspects of Japanese culture in our family came mostly from, from my mother. 
more than my father. Her role is very, very central in the sense of providing history uh, and culture to the children and um, providing a really keen artistic sense to all that we do. Dad was uh, very fortunate, too, to have somebody like Mom that had has a uh, appreciation for his talent and also very, <laughs> she has good business skills. After the war, uh, four years in the Army, I was liberated. And I felt f so free to do anything I want to. And so I started experimenting a lot. It's actually a burl from an old Northwest Red Cedar. Some people think uh, I am is a model for this. <laughs> I think about that time I was uh, still very much interested and in influenced by European paintings like Picasso, Matisse, and uh, uh, later abstractionists. Also by Archipenko, who came to uh, the art school and taught one summer. He was probably one of the most potent and important uh, sculptors of that time. I think he uh, really taught me the real meaning of modern sculpture. You know, Mark Toby was the one who uh, reawakened me. You know, when I was trying to do a uh, paint like uh, Brock and Picasso, Matisse, Toby said, what are you doing here, you know? Why don't you, why don't you look back and see what your ancestors did? And we sat and uh, beer and sake and drank that and talked for hours and hours, sometimes two, three hours, uh, o'clock in the morning. He was really my great teacher. My parents entertained a lot, and there were many notable Asian artists and artists from Japan who came to the University of Washington. And so parties and entertaining would be a chance for uh, other artists from Seattle to meet and, and mingle with these people. My father, having been associated with the university as a professor for so many years, taught so many artists in, who are now living and working in the Northwest and in other parts of the world. After the dinner, I brought out uh, sumi ink and brushes. Uh, we would take a paper and do a sumi. This is a book we started with Chihuly. Yeah, okay. An important. Um, relic and, and part of our collection from that time is collecting the autographs and signatures and messages from these really notable people in these Japanese books and they're all signed in sumi so there are many many volumes of these books and a lot of Seattle artists have signed them as well. They all talk about food. <laughs> I guess they enjoy the dinner. Yeah. Middle 60s, I gradually uh, switched over to Sumi painting technique. I was uh, getting a little tired of the Western or the European uh, notion of uh, art. And that's where I became interested again in the oriental culture which uh, I learned about in my childhood. You uh, try to, to uh, express your feeling, response to whatever you're looking at. I think the family things really stick in my mind. We'd camp together, we'd go to Shy Shy Beach, you know, and we did 
wonderful camping there, and my father would go painting. He used these trips as sources of inspiration. And, you know, uh, he would be happy. We'd be sitting on the beach, and he would look at the mountains, and, you know, he could feel his energy. And, um, you know, it was, uh, he was just involved. He was so involved in it, and he, his strokes were real just deft, and, and he would knock out these paintings. Sometimes would, they would go really fast, you know, and, uh, and I, I mean, I look at him, I go, man, this guy knows what he's doing, you know. And he'd grab the brush, and pretty soon, you know, blam, you know, all of a sudden there'd be four beautiful paintings, Sumi or something, watercolor, lined up on the logs, and then he'd sit down and, and he'd grab a, uh, he'd bring some scotch, <laughs> some Johnny Walker Black or something, and have some ice, and then he'd kick back and relax, you know, and this and that, and then he would sort of wind down. But, you know, he would, he could see that he was excited about it. He would be get, get pumped up about doing it. And, you know, wow, he was really cooking, you know. Most of the paintings were done on the spot. So uh, when I went camping and climbing and uh, picnicking up and down the Cascade Mountains of the Jet Sound area, I always took this paper with me. This Sumi ink on rice paper is very fluid and the only other element to modulate the tone value is water so again we have this water which is a essential element in our uh, northwest scene the strongest impression that i get just living here like uh, getting up in the morning and looking out and see Mount Rainier over there. This assures me <laughs> that I'm in good God's hands. <laughs> I always feel very humble to uh, the great uh, nature. The obos is simply a pile of rocks erected by the natives of Tibet at a source of water and mountain peaks, mountain pass. And it's something that the natives do spontaneously to offer their thanks to the gods. The concept was a beautiful one, I think. So later, I go to Nepal to see these things. I was 67 years old. And we uh, trekked up to 16,000 feet. This thick cloud came, and I was very, very cold, and I could hardly make this trek. But as I was going up, trying to uh, struggle up the hill, I saw these piles of rocks all over, all around me. And I said, this must be almost. Uh, it's a, a, a concept of a perfect harmony of man, heaven, and earth, and create perfect balance.
I think that his creativity was his ability to, to constantly come up with new ideas. He always has, has taught or talked about the importance of supernatural forces like nature. True art rejuvenates the spirit. The first library fountain that I designed just came from the Sobos idea. But because of the method I used in constructing this, it was much more open. I always uh, kept thinking while I was uh, constructing this sculpture, I said, gee, you know, if the citizens of Seattle didn't like this, I'll just have to run away, go to some other uh, city. <laughs> but fortunately, they really accepted it. And ever since, uh, the city and the various uh, corporations and groups began to do public art. fountains out for the people. And so I always consider this. I think it's very important that the people really enjoy it and appreciate it. They're attracted to the sound and the movement and the, of the water that you sometimes forget that you're downtown. The creation of a very large, a monumental metal sculpture requires the visualization of a form, but also its placement within the entire environment that it will sit in. The whole design is based on falling water. In other words, uh, I wanted to uh, use a natural flow or fall of water and not try to force it or jet it or spray it or do any uh, tricky tricks. From 1959 through 20 or 30 years, he created 60, 70 of these major sculptures. It was exciting. Every time my father installed a new fountain it was a big deal and lots of hoopla. And... I went back to Japan several times, but the last time I went was when I installed a fountain in the garden of the new art museum in Fukuyama. And that's in the neighborhood where I grew up. Okay, right there. So it was a very exciting trip. I've been doing this for a few years now. I think that the joy of it is the new sculpture, the new idea. If something isn't working, making it work. Okay, let's check the other guys. This one looks good. Take a look at this. Okay, all right. Much better over here now. Now, this is going to be dedicated tomorrow. And there'll be many, many people uh, from all over attending this uh, ceremony. Quite a few of my classmates. Uh, and they're all about 89, 90 years old. And sort of a sense of uh, uh, cycle or completion. And so to return to Fukuyama as an artist and being accepted and welcomed as one of the old classmates is a great pleasure, delight for me.
Buddhism or Shintoism, water is always used to uh, signify power of, of life. I agree with a lot of people who say that my dad's art isn't Japanese, and it, but it's not Western. It's, it's quite a synthesis of both. Some people transcend their ethnic characteristics and, and become people of the world. A lot of people still ask me, are you American or, or Japanese? Well, I'm neither. I'm both.